Welcome everyone. Nice to see you here tonight. Oops, wait a minute. Which view do I want? Oh, why do I still see Lindsay? Oh, well, um, <laughs> we're just going to go ahead. Uh, are we, um, Lindsay? I'm on. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That was very strange. That was the first time that happened. I was seeing Lindsay. So anyway, uh, welcome. That first tune was the Bonds of Harmony, and the second tune was Byron's Boutade. It was from 19, oh, wait a minute, from 2014, Playford Ball, a recording with the musician Cynthia Shaw on piano, Naomi Morse on violin, and G. Morrow, Constantina, and recorders. Hello again, as I said before, I'm Darlene Hamilton, who occasionally makes mistakes. And we are the Historical Tea and Dance Society. Um, Lindsay is our right-hand man, working the behind the scenes media and making sure that all your questions get answered and things get posted correctly. Answering your questions is an important part of this talk. So, if you are new to this procedure, please open up your chat box. You will find it on Facebook. Pretty obviously it's there. And we have Larry Hansen monitoring the Facebook page. Larry, come on up and say hello. There he is. <laughs> and in, if you're in Zoom, you'll see the icon down below for chat. And pull it up, it'll appear on the side, whatever side it's on. And we have Renee Turner monitoring all your questions in Zoom. We've gotten so busy that we need to have this. Hi, Renee. Nice to have you all with us. Um, we want to give a shout out to Karen Axelrod for her fabulous concert that she does every week, an hour, two hours before our show. And also to all our musicians who are out there making music for us to enjoy. There are so many different things that, you know, we all go to every week and listen to this beautiful music. And even the ones that are using recordings, um, we just love the recordings too. And we want you to know how much we are all thinking of you and appreciating you. Stick around for the after talk. And that will be posted on Historical Tea and Dance Friends page. And it will also be posted in the chat links on both the Zoom and the Facebook Live page. You want to stick around for that because tonight we may not get to a lot of questions during the talk because there's a lot of stuff to cover, but we will answer the questions in the after talk. So um, we look forward to seeing everybody face to face there. All right. Paul Ross has studied English and Scottish country dancing. Morris. Gambolska, oh, nope, I knew I was going <laughs> to mess it up. This is dance I don't know. Gamopolska and Hambo. He's a respected caller, organizer, and mentor. He apprenticed under Christine Helwig and Fried Herman and carries on the legacy of Fried de Mertz Herman dances and philosophies. And one of the ways he does that is through the Lennox Assembly Dance Weekend, which we will hear more about during this talk. Welcome, Paul. We're so happy to have you with us. Well, thank you very much, Darlene. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I greatly appreciate um, having all friends and family in the audience. Um, <laughs> would you like to start with the first theme? Absolutely. We are going to start with Thing one, it all started behind the sofa. Do I have that? There, nice and big. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I think uh, Lindsay's going to share a photo here of me when I was just a boy. And <clears throat> when I was about this age, I would hide behind the sofa near the bookcase in our living room <clears throat> while my father listened to Mozart or Beethoven on the hi-fi. I was thrilled by the music, and in time, my parents signed me up for music lessons and gave me my first LP, 
the American Legion band plays John Philip Sousa, and I marched around the living room to the Stars and Stripes forever. Decades later, my teacher Fried Herman would instruct her dancers, no marching. Little did she know, that's how I got my start. <laughs> Sounds like you really love to march. Uh, how does that compare for you with dancing? Well, I've often thought uh, how to distinguish um, marching from dancing. In both, we move to music. In both, we trace geometric formations on the floor. Both dance and marching require the coordination of one's own movements with others. And in both, we follow a choreography traced out by a leader. But there are differences and maybe we'll learn what some of those differences are as we move further into the talk. Did, did you study music? Did you study? Uh, yes, um, I, I continued to develop musically throughout my youth. I was singing because I had a good voice and I learned the trumpet because unlike the piano uh, on which I had started, it only had three things to push. <laughs> In high school, I joined choir and a cappella choir, the orchestra, and of course the marching band. Same in college, plus uh, brass choir. And in summer music camp, I joined a madrigal group and even sang the baritone solo in Foray's Requiem. Little did I suspect that it was all in preparation for doodling while calling English country dancing. Throughout high school and college, I was different from my peers in that I shunned rock and roll and, and dancing to rock and roll. My first love, well, maybe my second after John Philip Sousa, uh, was classical music, but you couldn't dance to it. At least I didn't have access to that kind of dancing. So dancing was not part of my youth. Still, I wanted to move to the music, and, um, and I, so I did the next best thing. I pretended to conduct <laughs> I did this at a very early age uh, when our parents would take us to the symphony orchestra concerts at John M. Green Hall uh, at Smith College in Northampton, which is my hometown. And I've done it ever since, but in secret, like that little boy behind the sofa. There is, I think, a connection between conducting and dancing, uh, just as there is between marching and dancing. Um, but that's maybe a little far afield from this storyline. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that the second LP my parents brought me was volume one of music for trumpet and orchestra with the Boston Symphony Orchestra first trumpeter, uh, John, Roger Voisin and the Cap Sinfonietta. I eventually owned all five volumes. The music was all Baroque, Luli, Corelli, Vivaldi, Purcell. Do any of those names remind you of composers of English country dance tunes? My youth was a setup for what came next. And what came next was both a choice and serendipity. And so, I think that leads right into thing two, doesn't it? it? It does indeed. With a very cryptic title, that you will understand in a minute. There, whoops, there we go. What kind yes. of science are you in? Right. <laughs> so we fast forward, <clears throat> pardon me, to the fall of 1971. I was discharged from the Navy that year and returned to the University of Chicago to resume a PhD program I had started in 1968. I chose not to continue with music, but rather to try dance. I was, I was tired of standing in the baritone section. <laughs> and by happy accident, the University of Chicago at that time offered two options, international folk dancing and English country dancing. And as a merit, matter of serendipity, I chose English country dancing. Needless to say, I loved it, and I did very well at it. The first night at the break, my teacher, Pat Talbot, came running over and asked me, what kind of science are you in? 
assuming that because I picked up the patterns of the dance so easily, I must be a scientist of some sort. She was a bit nonplussed when I told her political science. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, like so many other folks that we're hearing from that started many years ago, in the 70s in particular, yes. I know you learned many more styles than just English country dancing. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, Pat Talbot, whose photo you'll see in a moment, um, she taught uh, English country dancing, of course, Scottish, Hambo, Gamal, Polska, and other Scandinavian dances, and Morris dance. Um, and we can show number four of Pat Talbot there. Um, we learned Headington, Bamden, Bean Setting, Constant Billy, and the amazing solo jig Princess Royal with its spectacular straddle capers. By the way, I still have my Morris bells. I forgot to take them here, but if there are any young dancers out there who want to try Morris and are interested in a 40-year-old pair of Morris bells, see me offline. <laughs> um, so Pat rallied us on May Day to perform at the university. She also oversaw an annual Playford Ball in the Gothic Student Union building, Ida Noyes Hall, complete with a sit-down dinner of standing rib roast, Yorkshire pudding, and peas and mushrooms with Scottish trifle for dessert. <laughs> um, I want to go back to that other photo. Uh, Renee Kumu asked if that was Scott Higgs in the background with you. That first photo, I... remember? No, I, I okay, maybe not. I don't I think so. There, grab that moment. <laughs> okay, well, anyways, moving on. Um, you told me that all the dancing I love this. You told me that all the dancing you were doing back then was to a not just any re record player but a variable speed record player, and I really found that amusing because I know a lot of us are using apps to adjust the speed of the recording so we can dance to them and learn and stuff. So tell us about that a little bit. Well, it's true. All of our dancing was done to recorded music played on a variable speed record player. Um, we had, you know, those old 78s, I think, was it David Millstone who mentioned those in his talk? I, I'm not quite certain, but I think that and was Scott. one. And that, Scott. Or possibly it was yeah. Scott, yeah. Um, until someone whose name some of you will recognize joined our group, uh, Erna Lynn Vogue started dancing at the University of Chicago. If you don't know Erna Lynn, uh, you may know her dance, uh, Easter Morn. She and a fellow named Nick who played guitar offered to perform for us, and they called themselves the Idle Noise. <laughs> so a lot of the pieces of the life I would eventually lead were falling into place. Live music, a Playford ball, a variety of dance traditions, May Day celebrations, but two things were missing, camp experience and calling. So when did you start to dance outside your community at University of Chicago? Sounds like you eventually got there to camp dancing and such. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I danced exclusively at Chicago until uh, 1980. So Pat Talbot had been to Pinewoods in 1974 when Pat Shaw was there. And she came back all enthused from the experience. And at some point she asked me, had I ever been to camp? No, I had not. Are you married? She asked. No, I'm not married. So she said in no uncertain terms, you have to go to Pinewoods before you are married. So in 1980, I went to Pinewoods. I stayed in Lads Abundion, which is the collection of cabins uh, in Pinewoods off to the right of the dining hall. And I quickly understood what Pat meant when my roommate asked me half facetiously, would you like to contribute to the double bed fund. <laughs> so 
1981, I followed Faina to the church, to, to New York, and began dancing at the Metropolitan Duane Church, now called Church in the Village. You can see that on the right. And uh, courtesy of David and Sharon Green, who provided the wheels on Thursdays, I also danced in Westchester. Okay, we knew we were going to get some questions about this one. You're going to have to explain the double bed fund. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, all of the beds in the pine woods were, you know, twin beds. And uh, but some of the activity required double beds, if you know what I mean. So <laughs> I, guess, okay. I guess people found, found a way around that in their own way. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cute. Um, now, I, I should say some of the after hour activities. <laughs> <laughs> I heard from someone, and I won't say who, that you were a bit of a rascal on the dance floor way back then. Well, um, yeah, as a dancer, I was quite frisky. I recall the time uh, dancing the good man of Ballangee at Duane when I would, I would move to the women's side of the set and then back up to my own uh, place to make room as the women would lead through the men in the, in the A1. And in my set at the time was an older man, uh, John Hodgkin, he was treasurer of CDSS at the time. And he said to me with great exasperation, will you please stop fidgeting about? So <laughs> I was more amused than offended, but I got really annoyed when the word came back to me in Westchester that Freet thought that my siding was too bouncy. She criticized me too, by the way. I didn't take up English country dancing to worry about every moment about what my feet are doing. Of course, now largely because of Freet, I'm always thinking about what my feet are doing. Anyway, my teachers at the time, and that would be the next photo, uh, were the grand dames who followed May Gad in New York, Freed, of course, uh, Jenny Scheimer, Christine Helwig, Sue Sammons, and Bertha Hathari, who was uh, for a time the national director of CDSS. Uh, Tom Phillips, violinist, uh, and Beverly Francis were also teaching in New York um, in that period. And music in those days was provided by the legendary Phil Merrill and Marshall Barron in the city and Leah Barkin at CDW. I learned a lot of repertoire. I observed different styles and techniques of teaching and dancing. Uh, I watched very good dancing, but mostly I was just another dancer, albeit a good one, having a, a fun time on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Wow, um, that's a great story. Um, you know, aside from having these great teachers, was there some pivotal moment in your dancing when things seemed to change? And yeah, serious? let's look like at that next ever? photo. Two things did happen. First, in the early 90s, uh, Christine Helwig in invited me to join a demonstration group called the Chelsea English Country Dancers. Many good folks were part of this troupe. Uh, too many, really, to name. But we danced under Christine's direction to the music of Leah Barkin and George Davis, practicing at the General Theological Seminary on 9th Avenue, where David Green was librarian. The repertoire was all Christine's historical reconstructions, which she wove into medleys for us to perform at various locations. Phillipsburg Manor in Westchester uh, comes to mind, as does, does the Nomad Folk Festival. I learned the power of dancing as a group to bring out the beauty in our dances, spotting, careful timing, set awareness, stage presence, the corresponding carriage, uh, that gives sparkle to a demonstration. This is something that Katie German uh, spoke about so eloquently. Sharon Green and I co-led the group not long after the death of Christine, uh, Christine's husband, Ed, in 1998, but I ultimately chose not to continue. 
There were two reasons for my choice. One, the group needed an artistic vision, which Christine provided, and which I didn't feel that I could build on. And two, Freed asked me a question in Westchester that changed everything. And that leads us into thing number three. Yeah. Have you ever danced this dance before? Right, right. So photo number 10. It was probably sometime in 1990 when I was dancing at Country Dancers of Westchester. The Rose of Sharon had recently been published and Freet was teaching it to us for the first time. Those of you who know the dance will recall that in the B part, this is a long ways uh, duple minor improper dance. So in the B part, the twos are above and proper and the ones are below and improper. The first woman starts a right shoulder hay for three across with the twos. And the second man, in order to enter the hay, casts. Most people just cast, most, most second men just cast, but as a second man, I moved a bit closer to my partner in preparation for the separation that the cast entails. Freet noticed this. And at the end of the walkthrough, she came up to me and asked this most unexpected question. Have you ever danced this dance before? These words signaled something new in my relationship with Freet. She had noticed me in that moment as she noticed all her dancers, each in their own way and in their own circumstances. We made contact, not through hands or eyes, but through a question and a response, and a conversation began between us that lasted until her death 10 years ago. In some ways, it still continues. Only now I'm asking the questions, and I almost never get a response. <laughs> wow. Um, sounds like she was an amazing woman, and I, of course, never got oh, yes. to meet her, but uh, what was it about Preet's approach to English country dance that captivated you and, and so many others uh, so much? And it, it seems like it's still so much a part of your passion for your love of the dance. So can you tell us a little bit about what it is? What that thing is? I, I'll try <laughs> to hold myself to a little bit. <laughs> well, first came her basic belief that English country dancing is for us today as we are, and, and not an attempt to dance as though it were the mid 17th century. She writes in Serendipity, I know that we dance the old dances in different ways than they were danced then. Our shoes, our clothing, our manners are vastly different. For myself, I feel that's how it should be. We dance our way. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to dance as a modern person. Second, for Frit, Dancing musically was a part of dancing well, and she was all about dancing well. An English country dance, she said, is really a musical event. The music was always what I loved most about English country dancing, so this approach was very powerful. Third, Freet was amazingly creative in the dance. She extended its language. She brought many fine old tunes to life, which were pining to join the dance. She saw her dances as poems, and discovering them when she was teaching was as exciting as discovering a new novel by a beloved author or a never encountered before film by a favorite director. And finally, there was friendship. Over time, Faina and I, and Frit and Al, became friends. It was an unusual friendship in some ways, at least in the beginning, because I've never had another in which fear played so central a role. <laughs> Oops, not sure how that happened. Now, if we look at photo 11, as you can see from this next photo, we did have fun. And uh, she wrote two dances in my honor. 
One, the Bonds of Harmony, commissioned by Faina, and two, Fringe Benefits, which she wrote for me of her own volition. The Bonds of Harmony is a particular favorite. It has a figure, the Russian Gypsy, that is named in honor of Faina, who was born in Moscow. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's take it off that for a second, Lindsay. <laughs> I've never heard of a Russian gypsy move. Uh, what, what is that? <laughs> and then you can bring it back up if you want to talk okay. about it. But I've never heard of that move. That sounds well, really it, it is unique. It is unique to this dance. And um, well, to set the scene for it, uh, it is a long ways duple minor proper dance. And the first woman begins by facing down. She does not have, she is not facing her partner. Her partner in triple time sets toward her and ends up close behind her. And then the two of them, as, as a unit, do a wide right shoulder gypsy with the second woman. So it is basically two people acting as a unit, dancing with a third person, a right shoulder gypsy. Wow. And, uh, oh, it, is okay. not a, it is not a dolphin figure. <laughs> The first woman stays in the lead the whole time. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking that that might come in use. They've come in handy in some of these newly choreographed dances that are coming up. That sounds like a really nice figure. Thank you. Thank you for telling me about that. All right, moving well, she, on. <laughs> um, well, she, she um, did a companion page uh, for that dance, uh, which you'll see in a moment that uh, si since the dance was commissioned uh, for one of my significant birthdays, uh, it was presented to me in the color version that you see. It came with this companion page with flowers on it. Among those flowers are anemones. Uh, Frit could not possibly <coughs> have known that when I was born, my father brought my mother anemones while she was still in the hospital. So there was a lot of serendipity as well as fringe benefits in our friendship. But serendipity does not account for my entering Fritz's orbit. We have to go back in time, back to Chicago, to see how that happened. And that leads us to thing number four, the slippery slope. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, so how did I, how did I start calling dances badly? <laughs> but actually, I mean, how did it happen that I came to, to uh, call dances? So while dancing with Pat Talbot, I began writing down the names of the dances I particularly liked so that I could ask for them the next time. That was the beginning of a slippery slope. From writing down their names, I then wrote down crib notes so I could learn them better. Then when Pat Talbot retired and moved away, I was left as the one to teach the group. I did it as best I could, maybe not that well, uh, until I left Chicago in 1981 to join Faina who had moved there for her career. And after six or seven years of dancing in New York, I was asked to join the apprenticeship program in Westchester. My teachers were Freet, of course, and Christine Helwick, the two co-founders of that group. Wow. <laughs> uh, what was it like to apprentice with, uh, oh my God, you called them Grand Dames. That's a, that's a good name. Yes. Well, well um, it, it differed according to the personality of each, you can imagine. So, but the, the process was fairly um, comparable. We would consult about what to teach on an upcoming Thursday and review how I did after each session. Christine offered suggestions about what we do and gently nudged me uh, in the direction she wanted me to take that is teaching the old dances, which was her specialty. And Frit was, I don't know, casually terrifying. 
we're teaching in three days. Send me a list of 20 dances you'd like to do and make sure to include at least four set dances and three waltzes and alternates in case we need them. I just didn't have that amount of repertoire. And so many of my choices were dismissed. Um, do you really like that dance, she would ask. And I would respond with something lame. Um, well, it's popular in Westchester or no, but it's a great tune. And then I'd get a sheet of handwritten notes with often inscrutable comments. I think Orly knows all about this. And I would think, well, thank heavens next week, it's a party dance on Saturday with a guest caller. Maybe I'll have time to recover. <laughs> In 1993, I think it was, I was added to the teaching roster at Westchester. New York was more laid back and promoted me to teacher in 1991. Um, wow, that's 30 years ago next year, so I guess I'm going to have to sponsor a party. <laughs> Over the years, I slowly worked my way through most or maybe all of the mistakes that beginner callers make, and some of them I kept repeating until they were polished to a fairly well. Fried and Christine, of course, were helpful in setting me right, but so were Bertha Havari and Sue Sammons and Bruce Hamilton, who along with Robin Hayden uh, gave a caller's course in New York in 1998. And then there are the dancers themselves who have never shied away from giving bracing feedback. And I'm grateful to all these folks who uh, and to others not mentioned, for modeling best practices. And I think you became someone who really, really had a mission to share what you learned uh, from these teachers. And that's, that's an amazing thing, and we're so thankful for it. Tell us a little bit about that, because that's something that really stands out about you. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's true. Uh, throughout this learning process, my, the arc of my career did begin to take a certain shape. Uh, and, you know, like most callers, I, I started by helping people learn the track of a dance. And I would try to polish my skills with more and more complicated dances. Um, but because of Freed's example, and I, I was firmly in her orbit by now, and also my own desire to help dancers dance at least as well as I did, I evolved into a teacher of dancing and not just dances. And in time, I became a teacher of future teachers or teachers to be. Um, Paul, let me stop you for a minute here. We actually have a question. You had to have known this question was gonna be asked, but uh, Lindsay, go ahead and bring up our question. And then we'll awesome. get back to the... All right, James, we have you on the line now. If you'd like, you can unmute your microphone and turn on your camera and you can ask your question if you'd like. Okay, okay. are you getting that now? Oh, we did for a moment. Okay. Try turning I, on your I got camera again. for a password and I think that got blown and I'm not sure what's there. Hmm. Um, okay, well, we can hear your voice at least. Okay, I've started the video here and Hello, Paul. I re I'm, I'm waving. I'm remembering from years between when you've been speaking about when we worked at PC Magazine. Oh, hello, James. Yes. Hello. And Good to see you. <laughs> and I, I was, was wondering, you know, I've enjoyed uh, several of Freed's books that, that I've gotten and, and was happy to attend a workshop she did here in San Mateo a wow. number of years ago. Uh -huh. I don't know if you were present for that, but there was a, but, and I'm wondering of the prospects of her books coming back into print. Ah, well, it only took me 10 years to get ease and elegance back in print. <laughs> ah, that uh, one I have, yes. Okay, good. And serendipity is still in print. Uh, my next project will be to try and get um, either Fringe Benefits or Potter's Porch in print. The earlier books are going to be harder because Freed herself did not want them republished. And the reason, and, and when you hear this, you're going to say, oh yes, that's Freed. 
She didn't like some of the dances she published in those earlier books, and she didn't like the language that she used. So her comment to us was, well, unless I get a chance to redo those, I really don't want them republished. So um, that's, uh, that's a heavier lift than the, other, than the others. But I, I'm delighted to hear your interest in them. Thanks so much, James. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. We'll yeah, thank you. That. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the apprentice program uh, that we did in New York City. And uh, photo 14 is the next one with a collage. So in 2002, Country Dance New York launched an apprentice caller program. It came complete with a 15 page curriculum guide uh, with Jean Murrow, Beverly Francis, and myself as the senior teachers guiding and evaluating the apprentices. I was privileged to work with many friends who have gone on to highly successful careers leading English country dancing. All of these folks stepped on to the slippery slope each in their own way and each in their own time. Fortunately for the dance world, they outgrew their teacher, again, each in their own way and their own time. Most of what I passed along to these folks uh, was the standard building blocks of good calling. Nothing remarkable, really. You know, parsing instructions, pacing one's delivery, Bruce's mantra about brevity and the social contract between caller and dancers, rules of good programming, which I learned from Freet, working with the band, and so on. Yeah. I also wanted apprentices to work on one, or at most two, style points uh, in their teaching during an evening. I didn't want to graduate callers who were only practiced in teaching the track, but who could also bring out the magic. My own interest and commitment to this approach to teaching matured over the years, in part because of Freet's influence and because I wanted to share the pleasures I experienced myself when dancing well. Now, that's a phrase. You know, I know this is a real passion of yours, and um, you're going to tell us more about that concept, I think. <laughs> well, um, it's the subject of a, of a long, long um, weekend of, of workshops and, and talking, but I'll, I'll tell you what I can say in the time we have. The, the pleasures that I get from the English country dance, there really are four of them. First is the, the pure animal pleasure we have from moving. I, I love the different stepping in English country dance, what Freet calls texture. In Serendipity, she writes, texture gives color to a dance. It's the difference between dancing uh, and plodding along a track. After all, a skipping step or a skip change step does not necessarily get you there any faster but it gets you there in a different way. Then there's the intellectual pleasure of mastering movements and patterns. English country dances exercise not just the body, but the brain as well. And mastering the patterns of a new to you well-constructed dance is in itself a pleasure. Again, in Serendipity, Freet writes, remembering steps and figures causes the brain to produce endorphins. I have not checked with my biochemist wife as to whether that's true, but it probably is. <laughs> this elevates our mood. So no wonder that many people leave the dance less tired and in a happier frame of mind than when they came. Then there's aesthetic pleasure uh, in creating something beautiful. The patterns of our choreography and the fit between them and the excellent tunes create things of beauty. We gasp at the conclusion of a great classic like Measured Obsession for many reasons, but not least, I think, because it is so beautiful to behold in the mind's eye. When dancers first encounter a figure like the blossoming in Freet's 20 Years Waltz, 
it causes a kind of elation. And I don't know if you want to we are going to take a moment to show one of these beautiful videos from the Child Growth channel on YouTube. Let me just take one quick second to say we're going to post the links and there is a wonderful one with Frit's commentary on it. So if you haven't heard her instructing before, but please go ahead, Paul, and tell us more about this beautiful video. Well, the part that is the blossoming, I think you can imagine which one that is. That's um, the, the eight dancers have um, clustered together in a tight ring without hands. And then as they waltz backwards, they take hands below and raise them up above their heads into a ring of eight. And that movement is really so exciting. By the way, I want to give credit to David Millstone for the video. He, he just did a phenomenal job um, through a, a very <laughs> challenging uh, afternoon with Frit uh, leading our, us in dancing. So yeah, that, by the way, the, the figure that follows the, the circle is called the Serpentine, and Gary Rudman uses a similar figure in um, Terps of Courant, I believe. So how would I rank these pleasures? Which do I find most fulfilling? Well, maybe we should move on to the next theme, and that might throw some light on this question. Okay. Thing number five, you knew it was coming. The Lennox Assembly. And a little bit of child growth too. <laughs> right. So, starting in 1988 and annually thereafter for all of 20 years, Fried Herman led a session in the community center of Lennox Mass, known as the Fried for All. Uh, where she introduced her new dances and reintroduced the old ones. She had published three books of dances by that time and was working on the fourth, Choice Morsels. Maybe I'll show you the cover of that here. It's Choice Morsels. And she would eventually publish eight such books so there was a lot of new and exciting material yet to come, and that attracted a devoted following over the decades. And, um, I, I joined that devoted circle in the early 90s, and Frit took notice and would often put a handwritten note at the bottom of our acceptance letter, like the one from 1994 that you see here, where she writes, glad you are coming. Thank you. And I heard you, uh, you mentioned something called the Potter's Porch Sessions too. What were those all about? Potter's Porch. <laughs> <laughs> she actually dedicated a book to Potter's Porch. So, so these weekends did not happen uh, out of the blue. Freet prepared for them with what she called her Potter's Porch sessions, where a small group of dancers would work with her to test her new creations. They took place for many years on the back porch of Ed and Marge Potter, uh, their home up in Connecticut, hence the name. At some point, 
I joined those sessions as a regular attendee. That was fun. We had to be on our toes and ready for anything, and anticipating what would come next was pointless because it was always a surprise. Um, the street for all, uh, by the way, was not an exclusively East Coast affair, thanks to the efforts of the Seattle community and caller Judy Rifkin, who spearheaded the organization of the Freet for All Northwest. I and some other dancers accompanied Freet there in 1996, and then again 10 years later in 2006. And I think we'll see um, a list of dances from that session. Yeah, this is the Friday evening opening dance that Freed taught in 2006 uh, in Seattle. Um, you can see her selection uh, for the opening dance is classic Freed. It starts with an easy dance in jig time, followed by something somewhat meaty, the uh, ponderosa pine and triple time. And then an easy, or rather than a, yeah, then an easy set dance, what she would call a piece of fluff, Brian's Boutade, um, followed by another dance in jig time with a good tune, um, and then a waltz with a main tune and a change tune. Um, all, all classic freet. <laughs> By the way, all of her posters were handwritten, and so were all of her books. By 2006, I was regularly helping Freet uh, at her special events in one way or another. In Seattle, for instance, I was I called the final afternoon dance, and uh, Freet, you could imagine, was quite exhausted at that time. Um, for years, Freed had given an annual style workshop in Westchester called Ease and Elegance, and I assisted with the final one, uh, which was in January 2009. Freed, who passed away in January 2010, lived long enough to know that the first Lennox Assembly, which debuted in um, April 2009, had been a success. But how did it come about? Well, it started um, before the end of the last free for all in 2007, when some dancers approached me and uh, asked what's going to come next. But the real momentum uh, for the sequel came from Robin Hayden and uh, Marcel Lipke of the Amherst Dance. They wanted to dance in Lennox that would in some way be an heir to what Freed had done there for 20 years, while at the same time having its own character. So in January of 2008, I sent them an email outlining my vision of the weekend. And by the end of November of that year, we had our committee, our two teachers, our sound guy, Bob Mills, um, our band, which was Karen Axelrod, uh, Barbara Greenberg and Daniel Beerbaum, a rental contract and insurance. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first application came in on December 21st of that year, and we were off and running. Wow. That is so cool. And I have been lucky enough to go to one of those Lennox assemblies. Um, the Lennox assembly is different than a lot of dance weekends because it, it really does have a very specific purpose. Uh, isn't that correct? Yes. Um, well, it does have a mission. And, um, and I guess the mission does set it apart from other events. Um, in 2008, this is what I wrote uh, to Robin and uh, Marcel. For my part, I want a venue for teaching Fritz repertoire where the underlying consensus is that our time spent dancing should be spent dancing well, where people want to do more than dance an unfamiliar track, where they want to dance as if Freet were dancing, to use the memorable phrase that I think Arlene Goldberg coined at the last Freet for All. Lennox in 2009 seemed like the right time and place. And I've been lucky over the years to work with Robin and other teachers, 
uh, in the same mold, Bruce Hamilton, Andrew Shaw, Philippe Collins. They all have a commitment to dancing well, although each of them approaches that goal in their own way, often quite different from mine. I know somebody is going to ask me, what do you mean by dancing well? And that should take up about all of the after talk. <laughs> but let me circle around the question by listing some of the workshops that I've given at Lennox. And we can look at photo 20. So the, the first was Fried Herman style primer. And the other, and the next was intimacy and rejection in the English country dance. And then I did a workshop called Frit, uh, the Encyclopedia Friedanica, <laughs> bad pun, review of new figures. Uh, stop and flow, or stop now, flow in English country dancing. The hands are dancing. And look, hey, look me over. The theater of eye contact in Frit's choreography. This list hints at what we've tried to accomplish at the Lennox Assembly. Lennox has been an ideal place to share insights about dances and dancing. Of the many factors that contribute to dancing well, this weekend has been fortunate to have a solid and supportive organizing committee, a good hall, fabulous music, one of the best sound guys in the business, and all modesty aside, good teaching. Even the weather has been cooperative mostly. <laughs> and the weekend is aimed at teachers, model dancers, and strong dancers looking to up their game. So the company has been strong in its dancing ability and in its motivation to learn. Has this enabled the weekend to accomplish its mission? of promoting skillful dancing and securing Fritz's legacy. The weekend symbol is a lamp. The idea being that the dancers at Lennox would bring the warm glow of their experience back to their own dance communities. They would leave Lennox with the same enthusiasm that Pat Talbot left Pinewoods when she was there uh, with Pat Shaw, or when we left the Fritz for All and bring that knowledge and motivation back home with them. This has certainly happened, but to what degree? Very hard to measure. Wow. Well, I know I brought home some of that warm glow. I love the symbol of the lamp. I really love the symbol of the lamp. I think that's so great. Um, I need to interject just a little bit. Um, when you were talking about the four pleasures, I, I did interrupt you and you missed talking about the last one. And so a lot of people have been asking, what was that last pleasure? What was the fourth pleasure? Um, we could either go back and have you mention it or I could post your commentary on it, but I don't know if that's okay with you or not. Well, we did skip that and I might as well cover it now okay. because it's, it's, um, it's something that I think that everyone will uh, feel resonance with. And that is the social and emotional pleasure we get from connecting with others in the dance and letting the feelings unearthed by the music course through our bodies. The acts of cooperation and the rituals of friendship, the greeting and the leave taking, they run through so much of our choreography and they're the basis of the sociality we prize so highly. So yeah, that is, that is, of course, for many folks, the highest pleasure of all. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for catching that. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of people asking about it. Oh, Victor Lindsay said, would you recap? So the four of them are? Oh, um, well, they start with animal pleasure, <laughs> the pure animal pleasure of moving. And then the intellectual pleasure of mastering the patterns and uh, remembering uh, what comes next. Um, there's the aesthetic pleasure that you get from encountering a figure like the blossoming. And then there's the social and emotional pleasure that we get from connecting with others and letting the music course through our bodies. 
Thank you so much. I, and again, I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted, but I got excited <laughs> so, about that dance. Uh, all right. Well, we cannot end, uh, and we still have a few minutes left. We cannot end without talking about your wonderful YouTube channel, Child Grove, with just an amazing source of well danced dance videos for all of us to reference. So please, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, um, everyone has a legacy uh, of one sort or another, and in some ways, uh, this is mine. Um, I've been very fortunate to just have a great um, expanse of good dancing friends, many of whom are model dancers or teachers who dance so beautifully, and they've been so cooperative in, in helping to create uh, the videos that you see on the channel. Um, the, the, the channel itself is, it, I just don't know what to say about it. I mean, it's quite astonishing that it is now approaching 500,000 views. Who, who are all these people? <laughs> it's, it's really quite amazing. Also, the geographic spread is quite amazing. There's the US, the UK, and Japan, of course. Uh, Australia, Hungary, Poland, Italy, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, the Netherlands, South Korea, Austria. Also, Kyrgyzstan, Nigeria, Latvia, India, the Philippines, Indonesia and other unexpected places. Now looking at these results, I think maybe a desire to dance well endures and the legacy of Fried Herman can through this medium be preserved in some way into the future. Wow, that's a pretty impressive list. Um, and we're going to share another video and have you talk just a moment before we see it about what to look for as an example of when you talk about dancing well, which we will chat more about in the after talk. Yeah, so this uh, video is of Ponderosa Pine. It's a long ways duple minor improper and triple time. And uh, I teach a number of things when I, when I do this dance, but two key things. Uh, I request the, the dancers dancing the men's role to step outside the set in the A music when they do the left hand turn. And that's to make the turns round and expansive. And the second thing is I advise those dancing the women's role to do an impolite gypsy at the end of the gypsy chains, chains in uh, the B portion. And you'll see how that helps them enter into the corners meet figure. So those are the two things that I teach. Yeah, well, great. yes, and uh, I think that's a grand way to end our time together on that note, but I first want to ask you just a couple of quick questions. We're going to okay. run a few minutes over for everyone. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, what is your favorite dance? Because people always want to know. Well, I'll answer that this way. Um, Fried identifies four categories of dances. The those dances that are a piece of fluff, those that are meaty, those that are complicated and challenging, and those that are serious. So for the piece of fluff, 
I happen to like Saturday Triad. It's uh, a tune by Steve Hunt, and um, it's just a lot of fun. For the meaty dance, I like the introduction. Yeah, that's really a great dance. For the complicated dance, 20 Years Waltz. And for the serious dance, a dance called In the Seer, S-E-R-E, which was the last dance that Fried Herman wrote, and she wrote it for herself. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's, that's a great list of dances. I don't know that last one, but that's a great list of dances. All right. Are you a tea drinker? Right. Are you a tea drinker? Oh, am I a tea drinker? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You know, before I met Faina, I was not. But you can't marry a Russian woman and not drink tea. I mean, I had a choice of either tea or vodka, and I chose tea. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> thank you. And, and I like English country dance. Uh, Engl <laughs> English, country, <laughs> English breakfast, sorry. <laughs> I like English country dance, too. Now, Lindsay, this is a great place to slip in that photograph. Oh, that's my marriage photo. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful photo. Reloped. Aw. And that's Westchester. Another great photo. Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Paul, so much. And everyone, stick around for the after talk because there's obviously a lot more to talk about that we didn't get to a lot of questions because there was a lot of things that we wanted to cover. So come to the after chat, open your chat boxes if you haven't already, get it from there. Or if you signed up with our talk online throughout the course of the week, you've already got that link. We will be answering all your questions in the after talk, so please come. And thank you so much, Paul, for being with us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Did you want to say something? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm everyone. sorry. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. I, I, I just wanted to thank you and Lindsay and Renee and Larry. You guys are phenomenal. And folks, please do support the Historical Tea and Dance Society. Uh, they are quite an amazing group, and they're doing this huge service to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, that was, yes, Paul is very sweet. You'll see what I had to say what, in a minute. <laughs> but uh, thank you indeed to our Five Things team, Lindsay Verbal, and in the background, Renee Turner on Zoom and Larry Hansen on Facebook. Um, you've got the links, hopefully. Oh, coming up next Tuesday, July 14th is Dave Wiesler. He's a member of the band Goldcrest with Darren Douglas and Paul Ortz. His tunes continue to get picked up by choreographers of English Country Dance. He has 16 in volume three of Bar the Barnes book of English Country Dance tunes. And there are more in Gary Rudman's books, Calculated Figures and Joseph Pimentel. He's working on another book with him. So, you don't want to miss this next week full of beautiful music and stories with Dave. This Saturday, our Low Impact Historical Footwork 101 class starts and it's almost sold out. So go to our website if you're interested in that. If you know the basics and you want a 102 class, email us because we do have a little bit of space in that class as well. And tune in for our third Saturday. It's a different day, a different time, historical dance web chat, July 18th with Colin Hume. It's 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. England. He'll be live from England. And um, for our closing music, we have Hail Bop Circle. It's from CD Measure the Obsession. The band is MGM. The musicians are Marianne Martin on piano, Gene Murray on Con Murrow and on Constantina and recorders, Mary Lee on violin. And there's a link where it's available on Mary Lee's website. So buy it there and we'll open up the after talk in like two minutes or so, as soon as the music finishes. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you in just a couple minutes, I hope. Join us in the after talk. Bye, Paul. You. Thank you. Okay. Hey.